He's going to give us some background on Amnesty's operations in the region and talk about some of the um, challenges we're facing, Rohingyas and, and elsewhere. And also, I think the difficulties that um, Amnesty has, I mean, I read the reports, but I mean, how much traction do these reports get? I mean, I'm a journalist. We, 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 we file these, they go out, but then what? what's the follow-up? And I think you're going to talk about that. It can be quite frustrating. But um, So very important and interesting topic. So welcome, James. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Uh, Eric and I used to lift more than a pine occasionally, you know, when I was based across the, in Chuhai. Uh, um, I want to kind of just spend the next 15 minutes uh, reflecting about, you know, Amnesty's work um, in, in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, and uh, just to give you a sense of what I think in the last six months that work meant to me. Uh, so, so, you know, I will just kind of provide an analysis. Uh, I want to sort of just step back before that and just uh, give you a sense of Amnesty's operations in, in the region. Amnesty in the last four or five years has been trying to decentralize or diffuse uh, the International Secretariat in London to the region. Uh, we have three sub-regional offices, uh, uh, one in Colombo that's been newly set up. Uh, I'm heading the, the one in uh, Bangkok, where Southeast Asia and the Pacific is based. And also uh, there's one here in Hong Kong, and I want to just recognize my colleague Nicholas. Please go speak with him. Uh, he's got a bunch of colleagues here, and also Mabel, my colleague over there, who heads the Hong Kong section. Uh, good people. Uh, for Southeast Asia and the Pacific, we have sections or chapters in Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, and also we recently opened a national office uh, in Indonesia. We also have sections in Australia and uh, New Zealand, which puts our staff in total in that region a touch over 200. And, you know, and, and a strong uh, number of members. Uh, the one question I, I got asked this uh, evening, and I thought I'll just get that out of the way, is uh, how are we funded? Uh, we don't take money from governments or businesses. Uh, we broadly, uh, you know, um, uh, our membership uh, funded uh, something to the tune of, you know, uh, $100 or, or 100 pounds uh, per member. So, so what have I learned in the last six months, you know, with Amnesty, uh, as far as the Southeast Asia region is concerned? Uh, in particular, I have had engagements in the Philippines and extensively in Myanmar. I think there are two versions of reality, and the challenge is how to bridge the gap. Uh, Amnesty is an evidence-based research organization. It interviews people, victims. Uh, these days, we use satellite imagery to cross-reference uh, issues on the ground. Uh, we receive lots of pictures and videos. We also use technology to verify them. And we also talk to our partners in the media, uh, international aid workers, and other international organizations. And we try to build uh, a solid picture. Uh, in the case of Myanmar in the last few months, um, I'm chairing the Amnesty's International Global Crisis Coordination Committee. So I'm sitting at a vantage point where I get feeds from the movement, from the different officers in the ground, including advocacy points in Geneva and New York and Brussels. And from there, uh, I want to kind of zoom in and give you an example of the challenges we have in working with you know, governments that have you know, essentially committed uh, crimes against humanity. Uh, in this specific case of the Rohingyas, uh, we recently uh, issued a report. We interviewed 150 people. Uh, 120 of them were actually the refugees who were fleeing across the borders uh, uh, from Rakhine State into Bangladesh. We interviewed 30 professionals that include international aid workers, journalists, and other colleagues from different international organizations. Uh, we use um, satellite imagery of the burnt villages. Uh, we also verified videos 
and digital pictures that were sent to us. We also uh, uh, got medical verification of injuries, uh, and, and we have a process of quality uh, uh, assurance in Amnesty for all this uh, data to be verified. Uh, because Myanmar is in the region where uh, the regional office is, and plus I'm chairing that global coordination committee, uh, uh, almost all of the quality assurance goes through me, and in the last three and a half months, I've been you know, sort of seeing them up front. Um, in terms of engagement, uh, we have meetings with uh, uh, government officials in Napidor, um, including the, the relevant ministry, the Ministry of uh, Social Welfare and, and Relief. Uh, we've also had, you know, a ministerial level meeting um, with uh, the Minister of Education in Napidor. Uh, we have had access also uh, privately to, to Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, we meet with ambassadors both from the Western governments and, uh, and also from uh, Southeast Asia. And we also meet with NGOs. So the story I'm kind of trying to uh, you know, put together here is from that kind of perspective. Uh, what we can tell you for sure, based on our research is, there was systematic and targeted burning of Rohingya villages and houses. So if you look at a village that is of a mixed community, what you will see is the Rohingya portion of the village that is raised to the ground, right? So there was systematic evidence. Uh, people were shot as they fled. So most of the bullet wounds were either in the back or the back of the leg. Uh, and this is where we took pictures of them. We examined them, you know, uh, across the border in Cox Bazaar. We spent all of September, our colleagues, you know, on the ground interviewing people. And then we sent those pictures out to the medical experts and had them verify that they were indeed gunshot wounds. Uh, there was this strategy of separating uh, boys and men, especially boys of fighting age, uh, who were taken uh, into the forest, and, and we are still investigating that. Uh, women and young children were kept aside. They were sexually abused, they were raped, and in some cases, they were locked into the houses and burnt, right? Uh, so who was doing that? Um, we have been circulating uh, the badges of different military commands to the people that we have uh, been interviewing, and uh, the role of the Western Command comes out very strongly as one of the perforator because they wear the badges on the sleeve. Uh, there were also uh, the light infantry divisions of 33 and 99 that were rotated into uh, the Rakhine State. And now these are hardcore divisions because they are also, you know, uh, sweeping up uh, in other conflict areas in Kachin and Shan. So they've been sort of moved over. So these were all you know, uh, identified when we presented those kinds of um, images and badges. Uh, how do we contextualize, I think, uh, this situation in uh, the Rakhine State? I think, first of all, I think we need to understand that Myanmar is essentially a country at war. There is ongoing conflict in the Shan and Kachin State. If you speak to the diplomats, they will tell you, James, there are only two areas that, are, that is under control, Yangon and Mandalay. The rest of the country is in war, right? So, so that's the kind of context that we kind of get into. Uh, the role of the military is key because they are also infused into the police. It's very interesting when you have dialogues with you know, uh, ASEAN member states, especially the Indonesians. Now, the Indonesians are playing a big part in trying to reform the police. In fact, the choice of the ambassadors is very, very clear. Every ambassador, and I've just spoken to, to, to one, just, you know, I, I just came back from Myanmar yesterday. So um, the outgoing uh, ambassador from, uh, uh, of Indonesia who has been there four years is a retired police senior official. So he's been dialoguing, you know, and he, he will tell me that, you know, 
the key thing is we need to ensure there is police reform and they know how to do their job. In fact, the incoming ambassador is also a senior police officer. So Indonesia has taken a very interesting approach in trying to help uh, uh, Myanmar. Uh, I think the key problem from that meeting that I got was in the recent case, you know, um, one of the things we found was the disproportionate use of force. That's simply because they are unable to make a distinction between those who are involved in the armed attack and those who are, you know, sympathizers and supporters. So they took a broad sweep against everybody. And uh, those with experienced police and military training tell you that, you know, that is because you do not have a nuanced understanding of who you're dealing with. Uh, that's one thing that's very clear when you go to the ground is there is a deep-rooted prejudice both within uh, Rakhine State and, you know, uh, broader uh, uh, Myanmar society. And uh, we also need to understand the Rakhine community feels squeezed, one from the Burmans and from the other side from the Rohingyas. So they feel a little bit more pressure uh, and, and I think that has to be factored in in how we read the situation. The ambassadors who went to uh, on an uh, organized tour of the state uh, confirmed that you know tensions are raw and electric, and in the short term, you know they are at a loss in terms of how they can bring things together. The NLD, we also need to know where the NLD, the civilian government sits. It's essentially just a crust, a democratic crust on a military regime. There's no penetration below. It's an all boys club. Everybody knows each other. They've just put on civilian clothes. So that's the challenge that Aung San Suu Kyi faces, uh, you know, leading a thin crust in a very well-established regime. There is no communication between the two. So they are there, but they don't talk to each other. So part of the challenge is, you know, and this is our assessment, that when you present evidence, as I mentioned uh, earlier, and you put it out there to the officials, they cannot accept. They think it's false, it's fake, it's generated by foreign interference, and that they have a better grasp of reality. So for me, six months looking at the situation, and, and to some extent, I think we can also say a little bit, it's similar also in the Philippines uh, with the war on drugs. They cannot accept the internationally verified documentation and evidence. And if there is a gap then there's a bit of a challenge in terms of how we walk in the recommendations. Uh, what are some of the things I think uh, we need to keep in mind in, in relation to Aung San Suu Kyi? I think she's isolated because of one, you know, just sitting on a thin crust, and two, that there is no communication, and the fact that, you know, other communication is disbelieved. So that, that's the nub of the problem that we have here. Um, China, I guess in the case of Myanmar on the ground, uh, what you get is uh, China continues to focus on extractive industries, dams, and infrastructure. It does not actively participate in diplomatic or policy discussions. So China is, is not involved on the ground. Uh, ASEAN, you know, we have called for ASEAN to, to convene an emergency summit. Uh, I understand there have been overtures, you know, internally to see if they could uh, look into the possibility of accepting an ASEAN commission uh, to look into the matter. Of course, that's all, you know, um, not happening. Uh, so what's the analysis, I think, for, for this issue? I think uh, we need to look at the Rakhine state and go deep into to Myanmar society and try to understand the extreme p 
polarization in broader society. I want to come back to the point that this is a country still at war, right? It's over divided communities and the military is at the heart of the problem. Uh, I think the challenge would be to build cohesion, um, to have you know, technocrats and skilled people coming in uh, to look at how society can be integrate, integrated, but this has to be in the medium to long run. In the short term, it's hard. Uh, the other issue is also that we have over 600,000 people uh, across the border in, in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. And, and the question is, do they want to come back? Can they come back? Uh, what are the reasons why they left? Because when you talk to, to the government officials, you, you know, uh, they have a different point of view. Uh, so these are things to be addressed. So how, what can we do or what are we doing at Amnesty? Uh, we have our um, um, refugee experts actually on the ground uh, in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh just looking at uh, the camps, what are the, some of the humanitarian uh, challenges. Uh, we're looking at uh, to see how we can you know, put, kind, uh, put out some kind of output around that. Uh, we have, uh, we are investigating uh, the discriminatory practices that are in place uh, in Rakhine State and how this might affect, uh, especially when, you know, uh, if the refugees do come back and when they come back and if they come back. Uh, I think one of the interesting things I would like to flag for the, uh, uh, to, the, to your members here, uh, Eric, is the union enterprise. I don't know how much of uh, you have heard about the union enterprise. This is an initiative that has been uh, set up by Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, and uh, the aim is to try to harness private and public capital to push forward uh, development uh, in Rakhine State because it's seen that that is the root causes uh, of the conflict. Um, uh, we are looking to see how we can engage with this. These are very early days, and if we can somehow support that process by preempting uh, any potential uh, human rights issues that may emerge, because if the development aid and efforts are discriminatory, then, then there's going to be a problem. Uh, we continue to push uh, for the Myanmar government to adopt the findings of the Kofi Annan report uh, that is soundly supported by the international community uh, as, as well as you know, the diplomatic community uh, based in, in, in Yangon. Uh, we are wanting to push the attention on the military because our research, as I outlined in the early part, um, clearly shows the military are the cul culprits. We've been able to uh, identify the Western Command, uh, the Light Infantry Divisions of 33 and 99. Uh, we are not singling out anyone in particular yet, but we want to draw attention on the responsibility the senior general Ming Ong Liang has as the uh, commander of the um, uh, uh, Myanmar military. Uh, this, in, this scheme of things are not new. I mean, we have seen this in Sri Lanka, in Rwanda, in Kosovo. So what are the things we need to look out for? You will recall that earlier on I mentioned that the the boys and men were separated and marched off into the forest. Now we've been trying to uh, use satellite images to get a sense of if there were any mass graves. Uh, I mean, if it's in the forest, that's gonna be a problem. Uh, and uh, we'll need to also verify images and photos sent by local witnesses as they come in. Uh, these are very early stages. Uh, uh, we don't have e any evidence to, uh, to make further comment, but from how you know, these kinds of crisis issues have played out, 
uh, I think that's something to, to have out in the horizon. Uh, last but not least, um, uh, we are looking into how to verify uh, the range of comments. We, we get asked, are the boats coming? You know, now that we are on to the end of the monsoon season and, you know, sailing season will start, uh, we need to kind of, you know, uh, base it on evidence. Uh, it's very different from, you know, the last round where, where, where you saw um, human tra trafficking take place extensively and mass graves in holding areas in southern Thailand. In those days, at that time, the business model was different because it was travel first, pay later. So the people smugglers were then able to collect the volume of people and, you, you know, uh, did as they did, you know, uh, extort families and if they couldn't, you know, and if they couldn't provide for them, they died and they, they, they buried them off and that was all in the news uh, those years ago. But this time, I think um, the model has changed. Uh, we'll need to continue to verify it before we can confirm that perhaps you will have to pay now first before you can move. So that's an, have an impact. And the kind of people who have moved uh, quickly uh, in the last uh, couple of months, the 600,000 people are now, those people left without anything. So they may not be able to muster the resources to pay. The people who came earlier in 2012, they could have you know, mustered some resources, but again, you know, all speculation. So this is one of the things that our colleagues in, in, on the ground are trying to verify because I think there is a difference between rhetoric and reality. To me, um, Eric, you know, um, six months uh, into the assignment, um, having some engagement with uh, the Philippines, um, uh, extensive engagement in the last four months uh, around Myanmar, um, what I've uh, come to realize, you know, that uh, Amnesty, which is independent, uh, uh, relies very much uh, on evidence-based research. We have a rigorous quality assurance process. I've been privileged during this period to observe that firsthand from a vantage point, uh, you know, chairing the Global Coordination Committee on the crisis. Uh, but when we bring the evidence to the ground, uh, to officials and, you know, as high up as we can take them, there is a gap. And I think that's the challenge uh, for the work we do and how do we bridge the gap and how from that, you know, uh, we walk in uh, those recommendations. And I'll stop here. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, so we're going to have a Q&A. Um, it's only, we've got quite a lot of time. Thank cool. you. Um, I'd like to just ask you a question. I mean, you're obviously familiar with the Convention on Genocide. Uh, for AFPI, for the ethics, I just wrote a section on genocide. So I learned a lot of things. Genocide is, can be one person or six million Jews. So, and the only genocide conviction from the Balkans was Srebrenica, the 5,000 men and boys killed in Srebrenica. Uh, when you're looking at these forced deportations, separation of the group, we refer to the group, as you know, in the UN, and the uh, marching boys and men into forests, um, is Amnesty looking? Does, in, in Amnesty's terms, does this, could this qualify as genocide? And if, if it does, are you looking at the, the Hague and the International War Crimes Tribunal? Yeah. Um I think for us, I mean, bad things are happening. So for us, that's the starting line, bad things are happening. I think for genocide, I mean, there is the action as well as the intent. And I think that requires further investigation and validation. I think where we are quite clear in terms of where we stand is we are calling it as, uh, you know, crimes against humanity. And, you know, according to the Rome Statute, you know, there are 11 indicators. We are able, based on that information that I shared, uh, rape, murder, torture, displacement of people, we have counted six, and we are solidly, you know, standing behind uh, that claim. Uh, and, and, and that's already too bad. 
you know, uh, and we are now looking at the root causes so that we can go in and, you know, uh, make clear what's causing this problem. As far as we can see, uh, the Myanmar army wants to push the Rohingyas out. And from a 1.2 million, you know, uh, you have 600 who's gone out, about 100, 120 are still in the older IDP camps, and there's only several hundreds left. Now, we also have to add on uh, two to 300 um, uh, thousand people who, who were already uh, living in, in Bangladesh. So that's really uh, the push. Um, so these days, I think the, 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 the military is just sort of standing around, you know, at the river crossings or, 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 or the different areas where they cross uh, and, and are not actively shooting uh, uh, at them, but then also not uh, uh, preventing people. So, so that's our position is crimes against humanity. We get a sense that's ethnic cleansing. But I think uh, in terms of genocide, I think that's a very technical and yes. legal definition, which has you know, action and intent, and we will leave it to the experts to, to, to reflect on that. Yeah. Philip Sonny, uh, if, you, if you ask a question, please give your name and say who you uh, Philip Bowering, freelance journalist. Obviously, all the work you've done to reveal what's been happening uh, is very valuable in terms of protecting people in the future, we hope. However, when it comes to the fundamentals of this issue, surely it's not just the military, it is basically the whole, you know, the, 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 certainly the Burman population uh, believes these people shouldn't be there in the first place, which, you know, is the root cause. Um, Muslims who, you know, came originally from Bengal, but, you know, 100, 200 years ago. So, I mean, you know, if you're going to start, you know, moving people around in this, uh, there's no end to, to uh, ethnic cleansing anywhere in, in Asia or elsewhere. Uh, so how are you going to address this issue, which is not just one for the military, it's one for the whole uh, elite society in, and the whole uh, uh, monkhood in, 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 in Myanmar. And that leads to another point, which is that these people aren't simply originally uh, from Bengal and, and Muslims, but the fact, and here I have to refer back to the remarks of the then Myanmar Consul General here about six or seven years ago, when this uh, Rohingya issue first came to the public attention, uh, describing these people as obviously not uh, uh, Myanmarese because they were ugly, dark-skinned people, not like uh, light-colored people like, uh, like us and Chinese. Um, now, with that sort of deeply ingrained uh, racial uh, identification, uh, how do you really go about dealing with the fundamentals? Thank you, Philip. I, when I was living in Singapore when I was very young, I used to look out for his articles, uh, you know, very insightful. So. Um, Nice to hear the question, um, but yeah, our position is that you know um, the Rohingya, you know, um, live live in Myanmar, live in Rakhine State, and they have human rights. And even when they are pushed out, uh, they have a right to return and right to come back to a non-discriminatory environment. So this is what our standards and this is what we are uh, actively advocating and campaigning for. Um, we, in our most recent discussion just over the last couple of days, uh, when we had more information about the union enterprise, uh, including, uh, you know, a conversation with the ec economic advisors uh, to, to the union enterprise, um, uh, we, we f Get feedback that um, I think the economic solution itself uh, would not be complete if it doesn't look at the software, which means how do we address um, this uh, prejudicial, um, you know, uh, 
ways of thinking, values that seems not just, you know, uh, set in the Rakhine state, but, you know, in broader society. Uh, we began talking about um, integration approaches. Um, uh, so we were, you know, uh, the union enterprise, uh, to be fair, is very new. They're still thinking about it. Uh, but, you know, some of the things we heard is uh, to have hospitals that do not have discriminatory wards because our earlier research shows that the Rohingyas were separated. Uh, we asked questions about uh, how schools would be set up. And we also asked questions about, uh, because they're going to uh, construct new dwellings uh, for existing communities still in Rakhine State as well as those who are, you know, uh, will be returning or, you know, and uh, they will be allowed to return and if they return, you know, uh, where they will be uh, accommodated. So uh, we got a sense that it requires further thinking. Uh, from our meetings in Napidor, we went to, uh, you know, uh, interact with ambassadors. Uh, we were hosted by the Nordic House uh, that invited, uh, you know, ambassadors who were based there and we had a fairly good turnout. Uh, they were of the issues, yeah, but in the short term, it's going to be hard because the community is so polarized that really we are looking at uh, uh, mid to, 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 to long term issues. And you know, uh, Southeast Asia is quite a porous region with people coming in and out. We have large diaspora community, people, you know, moving internally. And, and I think one of the things, if we look at the region as a whole, right, I think we need more sort of integration efforts. And it's going to be, you know, uh, ongoing work. I guess for where Amnesty uh, sits, what we are suggesting is if we have an opportunity uh, to be part of the thinking or, uh, you know, we are consulted, we could be able to highlight where the potential human rights nubs would be, and and hopefully whatever plans that are rolled out uh, can be better. So it's still early days, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Florence de Changy. I report for Le Monde and the French National Radio. Well, thank you, first of all, because I think uh, I learned a lot, uh, more than I've read the news so far. So you clearly have amazing insight of uh, the situation. Actually, I was in uh, Myanmar undercover for the election and the release of Aung San Suu Kyi, so I'm all the more uh, interested. Um, my question is related to the role of Amnesty International. You clearly have this key role in gathering information, top quality, um, but then you also hinted at the brokering or the awareness uh, role that you may have when you meet these generals and try and make them understand the situation. I mean, I'm, I'm curious to know where do you find that Amnesty International's role is stopping and when do you want other institutions like the media and, possi and possibly the United Nations, the diplomats to take over? Okay, so again, I'll come back to our evidence-based research. So um, our reports generally, you know, first of all, provide the context of the investigation, uh, why we are doing it, and then we, you know, we, we clearly map out the methodologies used for assembling a report, and then we present the findings. Uh, after we present the findings, we usually make a set of recommendations. Uh, sometimes to the international community, it depends on the nature of the topic, sometimes to the national government, sometimes the local uh, authorities. So generally that's our pattern of recommendation. So the first stage is, you, you know, we gather the evidence, you know, we present it to the media, we, uh, you know, we, we, we do the spotlight on the issue and we try to campaign and create a momentum. Uh, for example, uh, in the early stages, we called on Aung San Suu Kyi to show some moral authority to speak up on the issue, but at the same time, we knew that a lot of the atrocities were committed by the military, so we tried to switch our campaign and focus on the military, on the senior general, uh, Ming Ong Lang, and, you know, and we were able to you know, bring some attention to it. 
So that's the kind of the, the public. Yeah. Next is the recommendations. So for the recommendation, it's something that, see, usually we send the report beforehand so that we get the governments or the stakeholders involved to give feedback. Uh, in many cases, they don't for a variety of reasons. One, they don't want to engage you. Two, sometimes you, you know, people don't read email. They have different ways of operating. They only pick up the phone or WhatsApp. You, you know, there are those kinds of challenges. So you need to interface, right? And for me, I think six months in the role in Southeast Asia, I think interface is key. Uh, and to bring the recommendations and to verbalize it. And when you verbalize it, they may have a different point of view, and that's what I was trying to highlight. You know, there's a reality gap, right? And that's where you start talking, right? So uh, we are not a technical organization to uh, provide humanitarian aid, but we can call that open access is given to humanitarian aid organizations. We call for the UN fact-finding mission to have clear access, even though Myanmar officials don't want to give that access because they think it's an impact on their sovereignty. But those are the kinds of recommendations we make, you know, uh, to, let's say to national governments and for international uh, community. For example, in the Myanmar case, we ask <coughs> that targeted sanctions uh, related to military hardware, training, uh, or even the finances of you know, individuals uh, where relevant and appropriate. Uh, so those are things that we call for in our recommendations to, you know, uh, to our selected audience. And then you know, we leave it to them to operationalize. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ilaria Bariasal. I work for Quartz. Um, so, w the, the question I have is, irrespectively of whether we want to label this genocide or not, I was seeing that on October the 18th, there was um, a statement from the UN concerning the Rakhine, where they were actually talking about atrocity crimes, which includes genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Um, and this, in a sense, if we were to take this forward, it would go a bit in the uh, respect that you just mentioned of uh, recommending sanctions, etc. However, um, this somehow takes us back a few years before this kind of half-hearted process of democratization that Myanmar has gone through. And uh, the missing link we had in putting sanctions on Myanmar, on the military regime, was China. So what I'm wondering is how much are you also talking to China about this issue? Because among the various governments, China has been one of the very few that has voiced support for uh, Naipido saying that this is a case of uh, a Muslim um, terrorist activities, etc. And it would seem that if everyone but China sides against Myanmar, we go back to the days when Myanmar could get away with anything because it had such a powerful backing. So I was just wondering how much you can in sure, involve sure. China yeah. in this conversation. And, and, yeah, and, and, and I'm just going to put my colleague on notice, Nicholas, you're going to answer this question. Uh, Nicholas is my counterpart. Uh, yeah, so, so you, you, you got 30 seconds while you gather your thoughts. Please come up. Uh, but uh, I, I would just repeat, you know, from the ground experience, uh, because I'm just coming back from uh, Yangon, uh, that uh, our interactions on the ground showed that at least the Chinese diplomatic community is not engaged beyond those business interests, and uh, they are not actively participating in diplomatic and policy discussions around this issue. But, you know, I'm privy to some of the information that comes through for, by chairing that committee, but I'll let Nicholas articulate, please. <laughs> Thank you, James, for putting me on the spot. I really appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> so we have the, the biggest crisis uh, in decades, right, with uh, 600,000 people uh, dumped from, you know, driven by a deliberate uh, policy of terror, intimidation, rape, uh, burning, uh, on 
you know, sitting on, on decades of discrimination, uh, uh, refusal to recognize the uh, nationality uh, of these people, and a polarization uh, mentioned by Philip that goes even higher now that the, there is a democratic veneer on, this, on the system. Uh, so for China to claim that uh, what is happening now is purely a domestic issue uh, and that the international community should not interfere in Myanmar's internal affair is just ridiculous. Uh, Bangladesh is dealing, uh, in Cox Bazar now you have a million people. Uh, you have 200,000 from the previous exodus. Uh, now you have over 600,000 more coming. More are still coming despite the claims by the army that they've stopped the operation. They're still burning villages, killing people, raping women and girls. So the, China's position is, is pure self-interest. They want to defend the principle of non-interference in uh, uh, internal affairs for their own benefit. Uh, they also want to keep an eye on the situation in the Uyghur, uh, the, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, uh, where they have a Muslim population of about 10 million, uh, which is uh, under severe and systematic uh, uh, control suppression and, and where we witness gross violation of human rights. Uh, and thirdly, they have economic interests in Rakhine states uh, with the, the major ports that they want to build for the, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. So yes, uh, they shield, China is shielding uh, uh, Myanmar. It has done for many years. They are shielding them now at the UN Security Council where there is a resolution, a project resolution that is being debated. Uh, but the thing is ASEAN and other countries and the international community has to put more pressure on China uh, simply because you know, if you let one country, I mean, the, the whole the whole region and the whole world is made of countries where you have majorities and minorities, ethnic, religious, or otherwise. If you start to allow a country to dump its unwanted minority, for whatever reason, on another country, and driving them through this kind of campaign that uh, involve, you know, crimes against humanity that are well documented. James talked about this, but this is not this is not Bosnia. This is happening with satellite imagery that can give us or by day by day confirmation of what is happening. If you let this happen and you don't react, you know, what is next? What is the next country? We have Muslim minorities in Thailand, and you have uh, minorities in Malaysia, you have I mean, all over the world. Let's not talk about Indonesia, the Philippines, and so on. So they, it's just intenable. This position is just intenable. Uh, China is getting scot-free for the moment. They see a great opportunity to get closer to uh, uh, Napido because the West is putting pressure on Suu Kyi and the, and, the, and, and the government, and they can come, step in, and say, oh, we support you, you know, don't, no interference, and so on. But it's really something that is at odds with what Xi Jinping just announced in the 19th Party Congress. He said China wants to play a positive role in global affairs. Well, here is a test, and here is how you're completely failing it. So I would say this is the position of amnesty. Whether we move Beijing on this or not, uh, uh, we'll see. But I think there is no way uh, that you can claim with any threat of credibility that it's just an internal matter for uh, Myanmar. Uh, Bangladesh is not happy about this, uh, and ASEAN, you know, which is always you know, more processed than progress, will have to get together and, and provide a response to this, even if you know, they, don't, they don't really like to address human rights issues. But the, what is at stake is just too important. You cannot let this happen. This creates a precedence that could seed chaos in the region and beyond. Short answer. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, uh, my name uh, is. Yeah, I, I just wanted to. Oh, put, sorry, James. No, 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 no. I just wanted to put Babe, Mabel on notice. I have another. <laughs> yeah. I have another colleague, Mabel. She's the director of the Hong Kong section. But I, when the moment uh, is appropriate, I'll invite her up so that she can also give you a first-hand account of how our sections in the region sort of you know come together to campaign on issues. Sorry, Mabel. Just stand by first. Yeah. But but uh, we'll take the question, please. Hi, uh, my name is Edward. I'm a guest to the FCC. Um, I have a charity working in um, Myanmar as well. Um, my questions would be about, um, you mentioned there's a general hatred towards the identity of Rohingya, right? It's way beyond just the military or 
just the Rakhine, it's the whole country. And do you think there's a, an intended implication on what identity the outsider um, conceive or take for these people? Um, because when I talk to many of my Myanmar friends or Rakhine friends, um, they think the identity of Rohingya is associated with um, different historical narrative that basically wipe out the existence of the Rakhine people in Rakhine. I mean, their families, their parents, their grandparents. Um, how do you balance the rights of self-identification of the group versus um, the, this kind of unintended implication that might fuel the nationalistic movement in the country? We certainly recognize this feeling of prejudice that uh, exists, you know, across the Rakhine state and very pronounced among the Rakhine community given because they get press on both sides, one by the Burmans and on the other side uh, uh, from the Rohingyas from their point of view. Um, and also it's, you know, in the broader sense also, you know, within society even among, you know, um, aid workers, local aid workers, NGO workers. But for us, you know, it's to focus on the human rights of the community. We strongly believe they have uh, rights as people who are living in uh, Rakhine State. And uh, whatever harm that has uh, fallen on them in terms of being shot at, killed, uh, sexual violence and rape, and you know, uh, coordinated displacement and pushing them out to the extent of even burning uh, their homes and also you know, uh, taking away their land. Uh, these are the things we call out and we want to ensure that they uh, get back uh, uh, into an environment where it's not discriminatory uh, because that's what they you know, flee. Uh, but the one question we get uh, often in this trip asked was Bangladesh. Uh, I, I think you, you can see, um, you know, uh, Nicholas's contribution and, you know, the, our office, you know, needs to interface with them. Uh, we also need to interface with our South Asia office and the colleagues who work on Bangladesh because the politics in Bangladesh also informs the Rohingya situation and the refugees there because uh, of the political parties there and how they might want to leverage on this as a political issue. Uh, whether it's the, uh, you know, the ruling party or, or, or any other opposition party. So I think what we uh, realized when we you know, did our missions to, to, to Myanmar was there is an information gap uh, of coming from the Bangladesh perspective and what's happening on the ground. And our recommendation actually is to now to integrate uh, also um, the colleagues from the South Asia office and uh, the, the researchers on Bangladesh uh, and, and our refugee team that's on the ground. Uh, to give you a sense of how important it is uh, for Amnesty as a movement and, and how our membership, which is seven million strong, uh, and we have uh, strong sections in the region, in East Asia, and, and also in South Asia. I want to invite my colleague, Mabel, who's the director of Hong Kong. She's a friend of mine. She, she lived many years in Thailand, and we have worked together. And she will give you a perspective of, you know, the muscle. <laughs> yeah, uh, James, really old friends for many years you know, in the region. Uh, I used to be in Southeast Asia, but then come back to Hong Kong uh, for the you know, Amnesty International Hong Kong. And for this, uh, when we talk about the Rohingya issues, it's not only uh, start from like few months ago. Amnesty work on, uh, you know, Myanmar as a whole uh, for many years, you know, start from also like from Aung San Suu Kyi's release and all these, we, we pay a lot of efforts and then in actually we develop a very strong solidarity uh, on this is because uh, previously we don't have any chance to go into the country and then for that um, our uh, the the our 
local chapter in different Asia country that we come together and then we have a very strong uh, demand uh, to our uh, international uh, secretary that we say that we cannot give up uh, Myanmar no matter what. So we have to put it into our priority. So until they got like uh, start to get elections and then to uh, release the like not uh, uh, no longer just have a military government, then uh, we still try our best to uh, adjust our strategy and then so we have a chance to go into the country and then to do the investigation and so on and so forth. And so for that, we are not only working at the you know, international or very, we say the very high level, uh, but we also work on the ground like uh, in Hong Kong or in other uh, Asian countries, the, our uh, local section, our local chapter, we do a lot of education work. Like we, um, I do remember that um, we used to have, uh, because with uh, FCC, we also have the Human Rights Press Award. And then uh, there was one year that the, um, uh, one of the photojournalists uh, got the press award by the Rohingya photos. And then we were we are also having it uh, exhibit uh, in in the uh, in the ground floor around the bar. And then I think that the members may also remember that. So uh, we do a lot of this kind of work, and then trying to inform the public. So it is not only the experts, it's not only the politicians that they are dealing with the issue, but then the public also need to know. And then we want to form a strong solidarity, like we always have these urgent actions and you know send letter to the governments, and then to arouse the people's attentions on all these. Uh, 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 situation happening. So and so that's why we always emphasize that we have uh, like seven million supporters all over the world. So, and then we have a very strong, um, solid membership movement. And then to to um, to make the whole issues not only stay at the very uh, high level between the politicians to talk, but then we are having peoples um, ready to help and give support. So these are the works that we are doing, yeah. And uh, uh, of course, uh, that I also want to remind you that uh, we are still working on the Pre uh, Human Rights Press Award, and then uh, Florence uh, <laughs> are also in our, you know, in our working group, and then uh, we will we will continue that, and then you may see a lot more stories uh, from the from the journalists in the region because we accept uh, entries that are. Uh, as long as the content is on, uh, you know, on Hong Kong, China, or the Asia region, so we will have more stories to come next year. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's please. right. Sorry, yeah. Michelle, yeah. member of the FCC. Is that enough? Um, you've mentioned uh, the range of chapters of Amnesty International in the region, including Australia, and we hear about the geopolitical role that China could play and uh, the role of Indonesia, which was quite insightful. That was very interesting about the police. But Australia seems to get off a little bit easy, doesn't it? I mean, here we are with Rohingyas locked away on Manus Island who this very week have been denied food, electricity, telecommunications, medical, everything, water, everything, unless they choose to go out into a community that is hostile to them. They are doing everything, my country, uh, to stop any boats of people coming from crises areas. And one would think that this is probably the biggest crisis in the region. We kind of get away, we, we get away without being held accountable to the dialogue. We want to be a part of ASEAN, we want to part of, be part of the Asia Pacific region, we want to moralise, I'm suggesting it's a point of view. Um, and yet we don't come up in the conversation about what's China doing and what's this person doing or, sorry, country doing or whatever. I'm just interested in knowing where Amnesty International, what its view or what its strategies are in terms of including Australia in responding. I mean, I, I obviously know that Amnesty International Australia feels like I do, but um, just, just, just a perspective just to put us in the conversation and make us a little bit accountable, sorry. I have been thinking about Australia um, in particular 
since I joined uh, Amnesty, uh, and, and more from the perspective of the section. Uh, the Australian section is very organised, the Amnesty section. Um, it's got 100 staff. That's all of what we have in the region. You know, my office only has 14 or 15 headcount. That's quite a lot. And uh, I'm told it's well-funded and self-funded because it can uh, raise money from the community. Uh, and I want to step back also to, to share a little bit about fundraising. Uh, these are known facts, you know. Uh, uh, most of our funding comes from chapters uh, that are based in Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand. Um, uh, we are trying to be self-sufficient in the region and uh, we are trying to increase our membership base and get them to contribute as well. So when I kind of put the, the map of the human rights clients, because the Southeast Asia and Pacific office covers Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Uh, when you put those numbers together, it's quite clear. Southeast Asia, you have 640 million. When you say Pacific, it's just 60 million. Australia is, you know, a touch above 22 million, and then it, it, it goes down drastically. You know, um, uh, PNG, it's about 8 million, and, you know, New Zealand, 4.5, and then in the tens of thousands. Uh, Financially, from a section perspective, uh, Australia is strong. But in terms of political impact, this is my early days. I'm just sort of, you know, putting my, my head out there since you asked that question for a perspective. Uh, I'm not sure about the political clout. Uh, and also the the approach. I, I think when we do human rights advocacy, uh, I think we need to listen to our audience. And uh, if I just come back to the uh, Indonesians, uh, they tell me, James, we don't do megaphone diplomacy. We do on the quiet. We're strategic. We meet for dinner. We send our technical people and we speak softly, but we speak firmly. So I think the, the approach uh, is something that needs to be thought through and calibrated. Uh, it doesn't mean a compromise on human rights principles, but I think the approach, the interface is important. It's like ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN is not the UN. Um, it doesn't have the legal system or the mechanisms through which you can make a paper submission and all of that. But however, um, you, it's based on relationship. So you need to approach the institution differently. And that's the sense that I get. And I think what it means for amnesty and this whole philosophy of moving to the ground, and which is our global project, um, and we have already rolled out offices in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and you know, South and Southeast Asia are the, the newest moves. I think we need to connect to the ground and speak to our audience uh, more effectively. That's my, my initial sense, uh, and, you know, and I'm hoping to learn and calibrate as I am move forward, yeah. Okay, say the clock. I'd just like to ask you one last question, James. It's been a fascinating talk. Is um, America first Donald Trump? You know, the friend of Erdogan, Putin. He went to Saudi and made a speech and human rights didn't come into it. Are you concerned at Amnesty that um, his, his Donald Trump is empowering undemocratic regimes in the region? Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a general sense of a withdrawal of America from maybe some of the positions it used to take in the past. So could you talk about that? Yeah. So again, I, I, I come back to the vantage point that I've been having in the last four and a half months. 
uh, you know, coordinating the uh, Global Crisis Committee on Myanmar and, you know, having it being fed from, you know, literally all quarters of amnesty. Uh, the thing that I can see very clearly is the traditional supporters of, let's say, you know, uh, human rights and human rights organizations, you know, the U.S., the U.K., the E.U., they are thinning out. I mean, the EU is difficult. You have Germany who that wants to do business. You can't really count on Spain and Portugal, you know. Um, and then, with, you know, the UK out. Um, I think we need to think about a new coalition of international communities that need to include, you know, partners from the non-traditional region. And in doing so, I think we also need to be mindful of their methods of working. And again, I, I come back to the Indonesian non-megaphone diplomacy. Um, they are quite clear what they want to achieve, but the approach is different. My sense is for the human rights work to advance, uh, we need to reconstitute a new coalition of supporters. And, and that may also, in addition to states, also include businesses and other international organizations. That's sort of, you know, my sense of how things are going. And, 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 and you know, I, I think uh, we need to keep an eye on the ball that way. I think we could talk all night, James, but um, is this? Token of the FCC's Thank you very appreciation. much. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think you, there's probably some more beer left where it came from. So I think James will be yeah. here for a while anyway. Yeah. So if you'd like to talk to him, and I'm, yeah, I'm sure yeah. you'll be open to answering any more questions. But it was insightful. And as Flor Florence said, I mean, I really learned. I mean, that was very, very interesting to, to hear your point of view. So.